Thank you for the invite to be part of Earth Up. In keeping the theme, I want to start with a little prayer. Well, actually, it's an action prayer, so do it with me. Here is the land. Touch the ground. Here is the sky. Here are my friends. And here am I, Annie Stewart, the storyteller. And I'm proud to acknowledge that the story is being told on the land of the Jajarong people, the traditional owners of the country on which I sit. And today I interweave two stories to give you a sense of Australia and the environment and how we care for it. Now, the Jajarong people have a cultural belief that the souls of the ancestors live in the bird. Bunjil the eagle is the lord of the mountain Wah, the crow, has dominion over the hills and plains, and the bat is a friendly little sprite to guide you on your way home. And every night when the birds come nesting down at the lake and call out, I can't help but be reminded of this story. So let me take you back, back, back to June 1867, June's winter time over here, and there'd been a heavy frost overnight. It was as though a giant had sprinkled icing sugar all through the land. But as the sun came up over Wombat Hill, it melted a line of colour into the day. And onto this stage tumbled three young boys, William, age six, and his brother Alfred, who was four, and their friend Tom who was five. They were very young and new settlers in an old, old country. Well, they say the young boys were following the creek, looking for yabbies, which is sort of a freshwater prawn, or chasing goats. But that morning, they headed away from their homes as they followed the twisting and turning creek. Now, mid-morning, they climbed up the banks of the creek and they came into the area that was like open parklands. The early settlers didn't realise that the First Nations people had managed the land so carefully they used to do a cool winter burn-off so there'd be no raging bushfires in summer. But there they were, open parklands, on they continued, marching along in their play, sticks over the shoulders, pretending they were soldiers. And overhead, Bunjil kept a beady eye on them. Well, sometime past noon, they came to the road to Palan, and Mr Much, a storekeeper with his small shop, well, he spotted the boys and he could see they were heading towards the falls, which he was thought was a bit dangerous. So he went and talked to the young lads and he said, where are you fellas from? Connell's Gully. He said, listen, you're heading the wrong way. You gotta go back into town. He said, come with me. And he walked over and he showed them where they'd cut a huge sway through the forest for the telegraph line. He said, now follow that line all the way and it'll take you back into Dalesford, my hometown. Well, the boys thanked the man and they headed off. And for a while they did follow it. And who can say what sparked their interest next? Were they chasing butterflies, a spark of gold in the ground? But they headed west, away from home and town. And they headed up the road, Jubilee Lake, past the old sawmill. Now it was a Sunday. Any other day there'd be 50 men working up at that sawmill. Can you imagine what damage 50 sawmill employees did? But they wandered on and they walked past a young boy standing at his front gate. It was John Quinn. Well, he was a bit slow, this young fella but he knew they shouldn't be heading off on their own. He said, you shouldn't go into the forest by yourself. And he raced off to get his mum. But by the time he returned, the boys had disappeared into the forest. 
Well, they hadn't returned by midnight and the fathers went and reported it to the police. But on and on the boys worked. Now, as happened round these parts, as soon as the sun had set, it got cold. In fact, any old bushy would have tell you, oh, there'll be another frost tonight, that's for sure. The boys hadn't eaten all day. They were weak. Hypothermia had set in and now they were shivering cold. Overhead, the bats were starting to come out and they were calling the boys on. Come a little further, come a little further. There was a hut nearby that would be warm and safe. And they continued on, but they came to a fence. Well, they were too weak to climb over, so they followed that fence like a lifeline at sea until they came to a hollowed out tree. And William, the oldest, had taken charge. And he said, listen, we'll rest here tonight. They'll find us in the morning. So he put his little brother, Alfie, only four years of age, at the back of the tree, then Tom, and he stood guard. This was to be their last earthly night. And overhead, a lone cockatoo screeched its way home. Well, the next morning it was printed in the newspapers. It was brought to our attention just before mid last, midnight last night that three young boys are lost in the bush. Well, the town closed down. Shops were closed and everyone came out to help in the search. There were timber cutters, sawmill workers, loggers and gold miners. Can you imagine the devastation of all those workers on the land around here? But nonetheless, they started looking for the boys. On the town hall, the bell rang out as a beacon so that others wouldn't get lost. For four days, in the freezing cold and the biting rain, they searched for those young fellas, but nothing. It was decided then to call on some Aboriginal trackers who worked on a farm out the road. Berberin and Merin Merin were their names, and they came to the site. They looked around at the last known sighting of those boys, but there'd been so many people on horseback, so many people walking around that they'd muddied up all the prints and it was hard to find anything. Overhead, Wah the crow called out, Bunjil had appeared high in the sky. They knew this was trouble for sure. Four days and no sighting of them. But finally, they found two little footprints at the Wombat Creek. Day after day, the whole town kept searching, but no trace after the boys. And after eight days, it was decided that the shops would have to open up again. The poor, despondent family waited at home. And every time the doors would open, their hearts would raise. Were their boys on their way home? Only to be deflated. No news. Well, a small group promised that they would continue the search every Sunday. They would search under every rock, every nook, until they found some trace of the boys. What had happened? Had they disappeared? How? Had they followed a stranger? Had spirits taken them all away? Week after week passed. No news. Nothing. Month after month. Until finally, on that fateful day, the 13th of September, Mr Mackay was out on his property on the edge of the wombat forest. There were crows everywhere, squawking, and he wondered what was up. And then his dog came bounding towards him, and he realised the dog had something in his mouth. Drop, boy, drop. It was a small boot. The lost children 
he'd found them. There they were, sheltered in the hollow trees. Well, the town gathered and a subscription was taken for a headstone to be erected to the boys. Maybe their mothers had some comfort now at last the bodies had been found and the whole town marched in parade up to the cemetery to attend the service. But of course those mothers were never quite the same. And years and years later, Mr Graham wanted to do something to thank for the town. So he do donated money to the local primary school for an award that was handed out every year. One boy, one girl would receive the Graham Ducks Award for scholastic ability and leadership. It still continues on to this very day. But I can't help but to think those little boys, when the birds were calling them, telling them to go home, that they didn't understand the language of the forest. They were just new settlers in an old, old country. But I bring the story forward a bit now. Have we learnt how to live on the landscape? It's now 2019 and I'm going to drive you an hour and a half west from where I live to near a little town called Ararat. It's on the main highway between Melbourne and Adelaide. And the major roadworks department has said there's a very dangerous part of the road and it needs to be widened. And in their project report, they said that over 2,000 trees would be removed. Now that's bad enough in itself, but the government said, oh, this will be offset. But how can you offset trees that are hundreds of years old? How many places of habitat and how many creatures lived in those old trees? But worse still, these trees were very culturally and spiritually significant to a neighbouring clan, the Javarong people. And so it was about a thousand days ago, an Aboriginal embassy, a tent embassy, was set up on this land and people sat there to protect it. Now it's secret women's business on the land and it is not really my story to tell, but it's been reported in the papers and I can tell you a small part of it. There's another hollowed tree, like the one those poor little boys died in, but on Jaburong country, these were known as birthing trees and they'd used fire to help modify them and many generations of women had given birth in those trees and it is reported that every time a child was born a tree would be planted with their pillar center and that tree was known as your direction tree and you would come back there to ponder and think and be part and one with the country but towards the end of 2020 in October, when the Victorian government was announcing that we were about to open up after lockdown, one huge old majesty of a tree, a fickleback, a directions tree, was cut down. Many of the Jabberung people were heartbroken and they have said that from now on, the sound of the chainsaw will haunt them forever. They were devastated. But the rest of the trees have had a hole placed on them and nothing can happen until it goes to court again. It's a sad story indeed. But here, as we talk about Earth Up and what can be done to save our planet, it occurs to me that we need 
to believe and understand and have deep reverence for the country like our First Nations people. I pray for them that these important cultural artefacts remain forever. Thank you.